So, Damien Katani, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you for inviting me. We are going to be discussing your 2021 biography of Louis Ferdinand Céline, or Louis yeah. Ferdinand Céline, Journeys to the Extreme. Um, this was published yeah, 2021 by Reaction Books, I believe. And as people will imagine, this is a, a, a biography of Louis Ferdinand Céline, who people will know um, for death on credit and m mostly in the English for English speakers, uh, it will be for his masterpiece, Journey to the End of the Night. Um, so the, the, I mean, the question that stands out for me right at the beginning is this, this is a literary figure who the word controversy and Celine literally go hand in hand in, in every possible sense. They go hand in hand politically uh, in a literary sense, in a biographical sense, in, in a sort of personal biographical sense as well, controversy abound. Uh, so, you know, why did you take this risk, if, if you see it as a risk? It's a very good question. Um, so I came to Celine by a slightly circuitous route. Um, the second, my, my second book, so I'm, I'm a 19th and 20th century French literature specialist. Um, I'm, I'm at Birkbeck. And basically, um, my second, my first book was on Mallarmé, 19th century poet. My second book was on, um, it's called Evil in Non-French Thought. It was on the link between uh, ethics and French literature, specifically evil. One of my chapters was on Céline, um, because, you know, he, for the reasons you just stated, the controversy, but also um, the subject matter he treats in his literature. Um, so in the process of writing this chapter, which led me obviously to read in more detail uh, Journey to the End of the Night and more Céline, I became captivated by the author, by the visceral power of his writing, by his unflinching honesty, by the black humour and, and by the pathos actually you know for human suffering in, in the literature albeit said often said in a, in a quite hard-hitting and and uh, uh unsettling form um the biography itself was commissioned um by reaction press by uh, my editor vivian constantinopoulos who contacted me out of the blue on the strength of um I think that chapter plus another um, article I I did on on Celine subsequently in 2016. So um, it had been at the back of my mind to do something further, more specific on Celine after my book chapter, but I, you know, I had only very notionally been toying with the idea of writing a, a, a book, a monograph, a biography. But of course, you know, being contacted by um a prestigious publisher by reaction and asked then I couldn't really say no um and it slightly took me out of my comfort zone not just because it was Celine but also because you know I I had been my previous books had really been literary analysis mainly or, or you know French thought and writing a biography is a different beast but I suppose you could call it an intellectual biography in that I try to mesh the literary analysis with the um you know the an account of his life. What's he like to spend so much time with? Do you feel you got to know him? So, um, yes, I think the picture that emerges um, is of a very complex human being. Um, I mean, one might say that about just about anyone, <laughs> all, all uh, great artists. Obviously, as you, you've touched upon the controversy, the, the main there's a fundamental contradiction in seeing, which is, you know, how can someone who writes such great literature, which is um, in many ways, yes, it's shocking and it's hard hitting, but it's steeped in in pathos for human suffering on the one hand, then write these virulently anti-Semitic pamphlets on the other. So there's almost a kind of schizophrenia about that. And, and I think it's important to make the point, I mean, not all sitting scholars agree with me, but many do, that you know, the anti-Semitism is not a feature of the literature, it's a feature of the pamphlets. Um, that does not excuse the anti-Semitism, of course, but what it does do is it allows us to evaluate the literature, in my mind, separately from, from the, the pamphlets. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose I became um, 
uh, intrigued, both intrigued and disturbed, the more I read about him, about how he could also self-sabotage to such a degree. I mean, I think people have to bear in mind that, you know, Journey to the End of the Night uh, was catapulted him to fame literally overnight. He was practicing as a doctor. He had no intentions of becoming a, a great fated writer. Um, he almost wanted to get this novel out of his system to, to write this novel. And um, he was thrust into the spotlight and, you know, fated internationally, not just in France. Uh, and he wrote the pamphlets in 37. And I guess we'll talk about that in, in a bit. But um, uh and particularly Bagatelle Point Massacre, Trifles for a Massacre, you know, which was the first of the three anti-Semitic pamphlets. And of course, that alienated people. But I suppose in the light of then the Second World War and the Holocaust, the um seriousness of what he'd written was in a sense, you know, the, the virulent tone of what he'd written retrospectively took on a, a greater, a more sinister um uh tone in a sense. So um you know, and I, I think I don't I can't say I emerged um, particularly liking him as a person. I mean, I think he had some good facets, um, you know, and uh, it, particularly his role as GP. I think he genuinely cared about his patients. There was some humanity there, but, you know, I, it's it's impossible, I think, to defend the, the anti-Semitism. But I think he was also a damaged individual. Um, which again is not really an excuse. Um, well, it's not an excuse at all, actually, but it, it, it provides some kind of context for how he might, he went into that sinister direction. I mean, this is some, certainly something that comes across in your biography, and also, you know, as I said before, we start recording. I've been reading Death on Credit just to sort of get back into that headspace alongside other readings. But um, there's this sort of uh, you know this notion of a damaged individual, and you you realizing you don't particularly perhaps like him is that something that comes across in your biography is that this sort of unpredictable nature and a bit um the, the reason i mentioned death on credit is that the utilization of i'm not actually sure what the literary name for this is his usage of you know the dot 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 sort of this yep. pause and then no i need to just throw a bit more in there throw a bit more in there this sort of uh it's an excess of energy but the energy is so bitter that it's just an unpredictable nature and that Absolutely. comes across in the way you write about him as someone perhaps you get this feeling of if you're around him, I'm not really sure what's going to come next, whether it's going to be some yeah. sort of vitriol or maybe a care for a patient. But, but the fact you don't even know is sort of, your, you know, on the back foot sort of thing. Yeah, I, 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 I'd absolutely agree with that. And I think, you know, it's, I think he was always a bit of a ma maverick and always had this anarchical streak um, in terms of, you know, uh, and, and I think we'll probably touch upon that, but, the, you know, the, his... Psychi psychiatric problems or sort of potentially psychological problems he he was um both physically and mentally scarred by the first world war you know i think this is key i mean i i, I don't think this can be emphasized enough that that experience of being injured in late october 1914 by uh, a shell um you know which caused radial damage to his right arm but also um i you know uh, headaches and vertigo and tinnitus which which subsequently was diagnosed as probable many as disease um so you know that kept him awake at night and so forth and almost certainly post-traumatic stress disorder which as, as i'm sure you know at the time was not diagnosed as such there was no term ptsd so those three factors combined i think exacerbated that already unpredictable personality and um you know made him kind of a rather in, an already impulsive character even more kind of impulsive mm -hmm. uh and with a quite a, a jaundiced view um of well a very jaundiced view of war and, and man's capacity for 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 destruction um undoubtedly mm -hmm. do you think i mean of course it's a sort of fantastical question but do you think if uh if otherwise he might, perhaps might not have been as uh turned as sort of mad um but because it seems it seems even in the younger years there was something there that you as you said there's something anarchic or something impulsive but the war transforms that whereas maybe there would have been a possibility it could have gone the other way or do you think in time he would have just become always as 
cynical and uh so i suppose it, it's a tricky question to answer because you know the the other kind of counterfactual scenario is if he hadn't fought in the war and more specifically if he hadn't fought in the war and been injured in the way he was mm. and really traumatized by it it's quite possible he wouldn't have written the novel mm. voyage um he dabbled in writing in the 20s, writing, you know, two plays, Paul Graham Legalese, but of course that was already after the war. And that, you know, he didn't get very far with those. Um, but he did write in various letters, and I think I talk about it in the book in, you know, in the late 20s, early 30s, uh, to friends that, you know, he wanted to ex exorcise, you know, exercise the war. So there was something cathartic about writing a uh, journey to the end of the night. Um, and so you know maybe the engine for his literature was you know it's that it's maybe a bit of a cliche you know out of great suffering comes great art but i do think there's an element of truth to that with Celine. and i suppose um on the strength of the success of voyage um and and this kind of relates to your question that his follow-up novel death on credit in, came out in 36 which he really, really poured his whole heart and soul into. I mean, he's, he, he, he physically and mentally exhausted himself writing this novel, even more so than Journey. He took it extremely badly when the critical reception was was lukewarm, mm -hmm. particularly compared to, to, to Voyage, which was one of the reasons why, he, you know, I mean, amongst others, that he went in the anti-Semitic, uh, took the anti-Semitic route, um, so I think, um, I, I would, I, I definitely would agree with you that had he not fought in the war, it's quite possible, you know, he would not have, uh, have, have, you know, written the pampers, but then of course it, it's, it's also quite possible he wouldn't have become a great writer mm -hmm. because the, the motive for writing would not have been there in the same way. Mm. It's interesting that notion of exercising the war out of a system with uh, voyage journey, but, and then what do you think if if we were to try well stay with that notion of exercising something which which certainly comes across on death on credit it's just exhaustive like you know someone absolutely pouring every facet of their being out onto the page yeah um what do you think is was was left for him to exercise you, you mean in in, in death well, on you know yeah in death on credit because if the journey was this sort of uh action to, to get right, the war right. out I, of the I, system yeah, what's, yeah. what's left um, so I, I think probably it, it's difficult to say with, with absolute certainty, but I think that um, to go back to your question about, you know, his literary anarchism as opposed to his controversial literary side as opposed to the political and his military side, I do think there was also um, a part of him that cared deeply about the function of literature and the need to renew uh, re-energize French literary prose. Um, so I think Death on Credit was as much, um, it, it, there was a bit more stylistic experimentation than, than in Journey. He was taking the three dots, you know, the ellipses, the pauses further, the slang, the vernacular, the alcohol further, one step further. Um, and this was in part in reaction to the rather erudite, refined um, literature of, of a Proust or a Gide, right? His immediate predecessors of the, you know, the, the just before the uh, before and after the First World War. Um, he did, despite the somewhat sarcastic things he sometimes said about Proust, he did deep down recognize he was a great writer, and. Um, you know, and, and it's the classic case of, you know, if you quote someone a lot, even negatively, it means you recognize their their importance, right? So um, there was a, a a large part of ceiling, particularly in death on credit, that was trying to write against Pulse. So instead of the refined, erudite, highly wrought, um, complicated syntax, long sentences, etc., there's the short, punchy slang, oral language, um, the the gaps which which suggest a greater degree of emotional spontaneity, um, and I think that that probably served for him two two functions. I mean, one was to um, create a language that um, 
represented, if you like, the the underdog of society, right? The 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 the, the working and lower middle class. But also because death on credit is set during the Belle Epoque, which is exactly so, you know, the turn of the century or just after, which is exactly the same period that Proust writes about in uh, in remembrance of, of things past. Um, again, he wants to show the not so Belle Epoque, if you see it. I mean, the 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 um, Parisian underclass during the Belle Epoque that may be a side of life that via his own childhood that was not as privileged or as prosperous or as, you know, sheltered from socioeconomic difficulty as the world that is depicted in Proust. So, you know, I think um, probably uh, the, the exercising uh, component, exorcising, I should say, probably he, he largely got that out of his system in, in Voyage and then the follow-up novel was very much okay. You know, I've secured my reputation, albeit unexpectedly. My li- I have a literary platform to be a bit more experimental, a bit more bold, and but it at the time it backfires. It's subsequently, of course, it's been recognised as a classic. M- many Celines would say it's actually a better novel than. Um, Journey to the End of the Night. I mean, of course, I think they're both great in different ways. It's influenced people like Philip Roth, you know, the novel of initiation, Portnoy's Complaint, for example, he's explicitly said it was influenced by Death on Credit. So it's got its place in, in, in literary history, but at the time it hit Sydney very, very hard that it was not, it was poorly received. There's something interesting there. So um, I believe this is from Death on Credit. There's a scene near the beginning and I mean, I think Celine is doing this on purpose. This notion that you mentioned there of him wanting to show us something, show us the the prison underclass in relation as a sort of reaction against Proust. Um, and it's almost like dragging you by the collar. So there is, a, yeah. I believe it's um, he's a, a, a friend of his who's a woman in the book who is quite is a bit more optimistic near the beginning. She's talking about how good things are. And he sort of says, no, 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 you know, come along, come look. And he shows her. Uh, late at night, I believe it's a woman selling her child, likely into prostitution. Oh yes, and sort yes. of this, this, you know. On the one hand, of course, it's, it's, that's happening within the story, within the book, but it's also like <laughs> Celine's little nods to the reader of you. You're gonna look. My question there is, you know, and it's with all his 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 writing. Often you sort of you take a step and you go, oh, okay, right, we're right in front of it now. Why does he want? Why does he want to show us this constantly as well? You know, re- relentless. Why does he relentlessly want to show us almost this this just irredeemable nature of of man at sure. every um, turn? <laughs> yeah, I I I I I know I I, I know where you yeah I, I I you're not the first person to say this. So I mean that yeah episode you're talking about I think was in in real life actually with Elizabeth Craig his his then partner in the early thirties when but but I mean there are many exam- similar examples in the literature of yes being confronted by. Um, you know, horrible scenes such such as that. Um, I think it's a large part of it is um, it's not to shock the reader for shocking's sake, right? So it's not a look how outrageous I am. Uh, it's not outrage for outrage's sake. It's more, uh, in a sense, forcing the reader to confront harsh social realities that we're too scared to confront or that we brush under the carpet. Um, And uh, part of the reason for that is because um, Celine hated uh, phoniness and social hypocrisy, right? Um, Whether it's in civilian life or at war. So, I mean, the first example of that, of course, is the major example in in Journey to the End of the Night is the hypocrisy of um, peddling this myth mm. that uh, the war is a heroic patriotic enterprise that these young men have a moral duty to fight when in fact they're being sent to the slaughterhouse, right? And that comes across in the novel. And of course, it influenced people like Joseph Heller's Catch-22. I mean, there were many authors who were influenced by, by that. And in civilian life, you know, I can see other examples of um, in Journey again of um 
there's the example of um, the uh, woman, the, a mother um, whose daughter, um, um, you know, has lots of sexual relationships, constantly gets pregnant with married men, uh, and uh, Ferdinand, the narrator practicing as a doctor, is called uh, because she's had a botched abortion to try and, you know, <laughs> take care of the daughter. The mother doesn't want the daughter to be taken to hospital because she's thinking, what would the neighbours say? So that's an example of that kind of contradiction between a a social reality, which is, you know, an unpleasant, you know, a kind of botched ab ab abortion and uh, at that time, and uh, you know, an um, um, uh, unwedded mother versus the, the need to maintain a social facade. And I think... Um, uh, I think that's a large part of the reason is, you know, is to is 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 to show the discrepancy between the social reality we, the conventional social reality we want to construct for ourselves, the normative reality, if you will, uh, versus the, you know, the the gritty, sometimes unpleasant complexity of reality. I don't believe, and, and not everyone agrees with me on, on, on this, and I can quite completely see why. I don't believe that this is just gratuitously nihilistic mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, I, I the quote, I mean, it's not my quote. I, I just uh, basically <laughs> borrowed it and put it in the book. And there was a, a writer and critic called Mar Marcel Schwab, early 20th century, who said, Celine is not a nihilist. Um, if he's a pessimist, you know, he says, yes, yes, he's a pessimistic writer. But that pessimism is not nihilism. That pessimism is, is um, showing his frustration at man's powerlessness in the face of human suffering. Mm. So in, in, in other words, he says something like, it's, it's not that Celine hates humanity, it's that he loves humanity too much. But he's frustrated that, that he's powerless to do anything about it. Um, now, of course, it's easy to, I could quite understand why people would disagree with that position. And, and of course, I can't, you know, one can't prove it because it's literature um, and it's subjective. But, you know, there are examples of genuinely humane, compassionate characters or moments, he, even Ferdinand, the, um, who's in a sense the anti-heroic loser in a way, you know, he's deliberately presented as a kind of individual who drifts from event to event, doesn't really take ownership of his life and so on. But he um, he leaves no stone unturned, uh, Ferdinand, the main protagonist, once he's back in, on Civvy Street, once he's practicing as a doctor, he does everything he can to try and save one of his patients, the little boy Bibel from typhoid, right? He does everything. He goes to consult other doctors. He tries to find medicine, and he's absolutely heartbroken um, when the boy dies. Right. So that's one example. There are a couple of others. And um, now, to me, that's not the writing of a nihilist. Mm -hmm. Yes, one could argue that at times, Celine does he really need to go that far? Does he really need to depict that degree of, you know, gore or whatever you know suffering um is humanity really that cynical but i think that he's also trying to show that human nature is not intrinsically evil people it's, it's a kind of struggle for survival in a way and if people end up doing bad things it's out of the necessity for survival and also out of a self-interest but not in a kind of machiavellian calculated way it's really about survival i think that's interesting. I mean, I mean, because it's not, it's certainly not the, um, I'm sure you've been in many debates where you've had to sort of defend that p position because it's not, it's not the immediate response one would have to s for Celine. I mean, I, as you were talking, I was thinking of perhaps two other writers who are, who are adjacent within, uh, within time at this point who, you know, to take your title journeys to the extreme are also dealing with this, like this, what to do with this, uh, this limit that you broach within war. So on the one hand, we have Georges Bataille who would take the limit experience and yeah. try take, you know, many of the things that Celine is talking about, death, pain, suffering, sex, mm. and try transcend in some direction. And then on the other hand, we might have someone like Ernst Junger 
who would you yes. know, sort of stand amidst war and lean into it as some limit experience. And yet it's it's quite um, unique that you would say that actually amidst all that, Celine is taking all these transgressions, literary transgressions, and actually he's the one who's arriving at a more human position than yes. these other writers working at the time, even though it's very difficult to see. And it, yeah. I, for me, this is this is like the paradox that I found within the biography was the, the question that I kept coming back to, we're just thinking about this discussion was why did this man who wrote these books become a doctor? You know, it doesn't make any sense from the outside. And now, yes. but as you explain it, it begins to make sense. Indeed. No, I, I, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, the doctor, I, I mean, I think, again, this is something that's, that's, um, perhaps lost in, 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 in the wash, so to speak. Um, C Celine really uh, didn't set out to, to be a writer. I think, you know, he was from a, a kind of lower middle class, petty bourgeois background. You know, his father was had a rather, um, he was an insurance clerk, really, and was quite frustrated, you know, because he, he probably felt he could have done better. His mother, Celine's mother was... Um, his name, of course, was Louis de Touche. Sitting was his pen name. That was the um, name of his maternal grandmother, his favorite grandmother, which he later adopted. Um, but uh, you know, his his mother um, owned a lace shop in in, in the Passage Soiselle in the commercial um, district of Opera. So, although they weren't poor, they Celine. I suppose you could argue he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. You know, he was not from the kind of, yeah, Georges Bataille, Jean-Paul Sartre, Parisian bourgeoisie who went to, you know, the, the Grandes Écoles and, and followed a particular C education. Certainly not, certainly not Sartre. No, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and he was an autodidact. Um, uh, and, you know, he, he um, uh, so, so I think, and I think, so, to come back to the question about the doctor, I think um, he was always fascinated by the doctor, you know, as the idea of a respectable, noble profession, but also that um, resonated, I suppose, from an early age with his idea that the doctor has the power to help people and almost a kind of magical power to help people. Um, and um, particularly in light of his experiences of the First World War, he became a staunch pacifist. Um, and again, that was congruent, I suppose, with the idea of being a doctor, right, of curing people, of helping people, uh, you know, alleviating suffering rather than inflicting it, right? So, um, which, which again, might seem paradoxical given what he wrote in the, in the pamphlets. But so I think, I think, you know, I think the, um, he genuinely believed, um, in the, in the importance of the, the doctor's profession. I, I really think, um, in terms of if if one is to try and recuperate some kind of positive aspects of Sidney's personality, despite the awful things, um, I, I think one thing that struck me in the process of writing the biography, for instance, was he had this very prestigious role in the twenties, from about twenty four uh, until the late twenties, um, working for the. Epidemiolo epidemiology se section of the League of Nations um, based in Geneva, right? He was sent on many fact-finding missions. It was a well-paid job, very prestigious. He led teams of international doctors on fact-finding missions, you know, to the US, to Africa, all over the place. Um, he got frustrated by the kind of bureaucracy and politics of the League of Nations, and he essentially went back to practicing as a GP in Clichy, which at the time was, you know, it's become more gentrified now, but at the time was a kind of downtrodden suburb of Paris. Uh, and, you know, he he was willing to do that. You know, many of his patients were, were from poor backgrounds, didn't have the means. That clearly influences the the episode of Bardamu practicing in what he calls Rancy in the novel, but that's basically based on his experience of Clichy. So, you know, to me, that does signal a kind of genuine um, desire to, 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 to make some kind of difference via his medical um, uh, practice. Mm. 
even though he spends so much time in that novel sort of scorning his patients and, and disliking them, he still helps them. To... He still helps them. Well, of course, he, but then, of course, he satirizes him, or, or rather satirizes Baldwin because he says that the patients didn't respect him because he refused to chase them for money. So, you know, patients didn't pay him and he treated them anyway, but that had the, the, the paradoxical effect of of the patients not actually respecting him. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when when does he stop being a doctor? I mean, does he transition from being a full-time doctor into full-time writing or does he just continue being a doctor? And then right. Uh... Yeah, I, I, that, that's an interesting question, which, which I had to kind of investigate because it was not always easy to tell. I mean, I think um, as his literary... So pre-pamphlet, so pre-1937, you know, the... Um, the pamphlet that really, you know, the, the first anti-Semitic pamphlet that really um, alienated many, many people. Um, he found that he did try to carry on in his practice at Clichy, and th- this led to a, a falling out with his um, with his with his boss, um, and uh, who happened to to be Jewish, so that probably <laughs> didn't, didn't help, you know. To, the, the anti-Semitism, but but although I think that was a, a relatively minor factor in the great scheme of things, but he found that he just didn't have the time to juggle. You know, he wanted actually to carry on as a doctor, and he did, but he was constantly solicited for you know literary events um, because he hadn't anticipated the, the, the this overnight success, right? So um, he he was able more more or less to juggle both the writing and the and the um, medical practice. But during the Second World War, um, it was more difficult for him to practice for, for all sorts of logistical reasons. And also, he, as he became more more politically ostracized, and particularly as the tide of the war turned, um, when he got to Sigmaringen, which was the um, uh, part of Germany where the, to which the Vichy regime was um, transplanted or transferred in forty four, um, he did practice as a doctor there. He was given a role. Um, interestingly, the um, Maréchal Pétain, who of course had been the you know the the, the leader of the, the Vichy uh, regime, who was an aging an old man by then, uh, Céline wanted to be able to treat him because that would have been quite a plum role and Pétain refused to have anything to do with Sidney, right? So he didn't, you know. Um, and then during his exile, subsequently he was exiled to Denmark, um, or rather he sought exile in Denmark until he was arrested under pressure from, you know, the, the French pressure, the Danish government. He didn't practice there. Um, when he came back, when he was pardoned in fifty one, um, uh, you know, and by the French government, was allowed to return to France. Yeah, frankly, the medical practice was, you know, it was almost uh, symbolic. I mean, he, you know, he treated the old patient in Meudon, mm-hmm. which is the suburb of Paris where he lived. By then, his own health was declining, and you know, he really only had a handful of patients. And then he found the, you know, he sort of made this literary comeback and wrote what's known as the German trilogy of novels between um, 57 and and his death in 61. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess, um, you know, he kind of clung on to the medical career, but frankly, his medical career really peaked with the League of Nations in terms of prestige uh and and you know in Clichy he was busy with his practice but really when he became a famous writer it became almost impossible to com- to properly sustain the medical practice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean and, and you know you mentioned that his own health was failing that's something else that does also come across in 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 your book is this this not to be too cliche but this journey from actually a very um a man, a young man full of vitality and as you say sort of a, an anarchic character through to yeah. someone who's sort of i mean if you look at photos of celine as well he's an overbearing you know he's a big figure he has this very uh i don't really know like titanic 
stature. Yes. And then by the end, I mean, it is a journey of sort of like a rotting body is how it felt. Like by the end, he's, yeah. you know, he, he his, his death, I believe, if I'm remembering this correctly, is one where he's basically laying down all day and then maybe seeing someone for an hour because he's just absolutely racked uh, with uh, uh, migraines uh, 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 and illnesses. So it's this journey of by the end, he's sort of just this degraded uh, ab 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 absolutely and 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 i think you know the the experience that really aged him i think was his imprisonment in in denmark right so i mean for for, for the benefit of, <laughs> of viewers who who don't know this background i mean i think uh, you know he he went to copenhagen in in 45 in in after being in sigmund in march 45 um and lived incognito with his wife um and you know he was spotted by probably by a French journalist, and you know the French government got wind of this, and et cetera, et cetera. And he was arrested by the Danish police. And um, now the extradition laws didn't allow him to be extradited to to, to France, but he was under pressure from the French government um, imprisoned in Denmark for a period I think of fifteen months, mm -hmm. right? And uh, he, you know, occasionally had to be transferred to the prison hospital. You know, he had all sorts of stomach problems and he'd had dysentery when he traveled to Africa as a younger man, but because he was weak, his system was weakened. He had all sorts of sort of, yeah, medical problems. He lost a lot of weight when he emerged from prison. You know, I mean, the, the general accounts say he'd aged, you know, not 10 years, 20 years. Mm. And he had been quite a sort of dashing, you know, very um, young man and he you know he was a bit of a womanizer he prior you know at the height of his fame in the 30s and and i think denmark really i mean not that one can have a huge amount of sympathy for him given give you know there were reasons why he was imprisoned um you know that's the pamphlets of course so um uh so when he came back to france um Yes, he was, um, in a sense, uh, a shadow of his former self. But I think it's also important to stress that it's a little bit like, to me at least, and, and I'm not the first person to say this, it's a bit, there was an element of um, uh, self-image self or um, he wanted to portray the uh, uh, appearance of, of the unkempt, uh, you know, uh, hermit in a way. A bit like the contemporary author Michel Welbeck does now, right? And Michel Welbeck, you know, he likes to appear with a cigarette hanging from his mouth, his hair all over the place. Um, and I, I think there was an element of that with Celine. Yes, of course, he wasn't faking his um, his health condition and whatever. But I think there was a sort of well, you know a kind of defiant well i don't care attitude you know I, why i'm not going to make an effort to to dress up for you i'll i you've you know his argument was i've been victimized i shouldn't have been imprisoned i you know my pamphlets were you know meant not meant to cause any any, any harm i was a pacifist i wrote them for those reasons mm -hmm. and he he never fully um sh you know he never really showed remorse uh, for that and just portrayed or played the role of the victim mm -hmm. and therefore the the image of the unkempt uh hermit or you know who's been ostracized by society kind of reinforced that victim status i think so i mean we've been tiptoeing around them so we'll talk about the pamphlets in a sec but i guess just just a sort of one you know a, a final question in a way on the writing We've spoken about transgression. We've spoken about how he sort of fell into the writing and it being an exorcism. If there could be a notion of him wanting to do something or wanting to, to you know, there's that exorcism. There's also that showing people something about our the worst of the worst and but to try and find something in it. Do you think he felt he was successful as a writer before, you know, before this political turn in 37? Yes, I, I, I think so. I mean, I think he he knew his own worth as a writer. You know, I don't think, uh, I mean, he clearly had multiple character flaws, but I don't think it was arrogance, but I think he knew, he knew he was a great writer and he knew he was something, um, 
he, he knew he had a talent for writing that he was trying to do something different and and he was in many ways you know um uh i think um but he had a very fragile ego which is of course not unusual amongst you know six <laughs> sort of creative artists right particularly successful ones so the the success of voyage i think took him by surprise uh his ego was almost certainly mass so even though he got irritated by, by being solicited by everyone left right and center there was part of him clearly that was flattered and you know pleased by it um and and i think it's important to, to stress that because he took it extremely badly you know to come back to my previous point when death on credit um was not the, the success he had hoped for. You know, he, he really invested a lot of uh, psychological, emotional energy and set a lot of literary store by that. And this is linked to the question of the anti-Semitism in the sense that, um, I mean, clearly it's not the only reason, but, you know, he, he fell for that old anti anti-Semitic stereotype of, of the literary intelligentsia is dominated by Jews and they didn't like my book, therefore it's the fault of the Jew. You know, that was one of the components. But the timing of the pamphlet 37 um, of the first anti-Semitic pamphlet, he wrote an anti-communist one in 36 called Mia Kulpa, mm -hmm. um based on his visit of Stalinist Russia. But Bagatelle Point Massacre, he wrote a, a year or a year and a half after Death on Credit came out. Now, his argument was always, um, I wrote it because I could see the threat of another war looming. I wrote it out of pacifist, uh, a pacifist desire to prevent another war. Mm. Um, I mean, his flawed, clearly flawed argument was that, oh, it's the Jews are pushing Europe into another war. Well, I mean, I think history has shown that he was rather Hitler, <laughs> but, but in, according to his own lo logic, however warped, it was, um, you know, he justified and continued to justify the pamphlets even to, at the end of his life as, look, I was, I, I, I wrote them out of a sense of urgency because I'm a pacifist and I wanted to prevent another war, mm. right? Um, uh, and, you know, that that was his however you know untenable that may seem to us but that was his argument yeah i mean i guess it's difficult for us looking back now to of course there has been thousands of years history of anti-semitism but i guess especially from the modern yeah. world it's difficult for us to look back now and sort of untether anti-semitism from nazism because of you know the holocaust yes of course of because course. of the holocaust as they sort of um well, the absolute abortion of human life at a certain point in time that was inherently tied to anti-Semitism and, and well, uh, you know, supposed notions of uh, subhuman or genocide, etc. The reason I say that is it's tough to see, okay, well, how far along was Germany in 37? What did perhaps Céline know, you know, if, if we're not too familiar yeah. with history, if you see what I mean? It's tough now to look back and go, well, actually... <laughs> not to not to be too tongue in cheek it's almost like a homegrown anti-semitism outside of what we would now look back as this anti-semitic moment well actually this is not really attached to national socialism of germany in that period absolutely and i think this is one of the the, the arguments i make in the book is that um you know there's no question clearly of justifying the anti-semitism but um, i mean even Celine himself the only, the only kind of he was too proud ever to admit he was wrong about anything. But mm. um, the only concession, you know, he said in '46, I think, "Je n'ai jamais vu, voulu uh, uh, Buchenwald." I never wanted Buchenwald. You know, obviously the the death citing one of the death camps. Mm. And I, I'm personally prepared to believe that. Mm. But that, and, and you know, and, and of course, one could dispute that. But of course. That's not a justification for for the awful things he wrote in the pamphlets. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, he couldn't have known in '37 about what was going to happen in 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 you know from '42 to '45 in, in in terms of the Holocaust. So, um, um, I think I think also that, uh, and and this is perhaps a rather uncomfortable argument, particularly for some French 
civilian critics. Some some do 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 acknowledge this, but some kind of stay clear of it. Bagatelle Pont and Massacre was sold very well, <laughs> right? Mm. And even on Legit, who was not, uh, you know, who was on the liberal end of the spectrum, he was not an anti Semite. He he kind of said, oh, well, Bagatelle, yes, yeah, yeah, he says things about the Jews, but it's, 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 it's poor real, it's, it's comical, it's tongue in cheek. He, he kind of minimized it, right? Mm. Now, um, I think it also says something about the landscape of the time that, you know, the threshold of tolerance of uh, anti Semitism was, was pretty high, you know, um, in 37. And of course, some people were shocked by it, but many people just sort of said, well, you know, there was a lot of casual anti-Semitism around. I'm not suggesting that's not the case today. Um, clearly, it still is. But, it, it, you know, I, so I think I, this is not to exonerate Céline, but I think we also need to bear that in mind, <laughs> in that, you know, there was a lot of casual anti-Semitism around at the time. And um, I think it wasn't really until his follow-up uh, pamphlets. In '39, the French government did bring in a law called the Loi Marchand d'Or, where, you know, um, they, they, his pamphlet was kind of banned. Uh, so that's prior to the Holocaust. So it was still bad even for that time. But why did, you know, it did sell very well as well. So, um, so yeah. And even even though he, um, you know, he says that he wishes uh, Buchenwald didn't happen, does he change his stance? Does he change his anti-Semitic stuff? No, I mean, I think one would have liked to have seen some kind of, uh, you know, remorse. Uh, of course, you know, then people might say, well, oh, it's 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 crocodile tears, you know, whatever. But um, no, he, 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 he didn't. I mean, I mean, I think um, uh, because he he stuck rigidly to his logic that I wrote the pamphlets for this reason, mm. right? You know, it was a it was a desperate pacifism, and yes, I, I, uh, you know, but but clearly, but I think there is also evidence that he attended the lectures of you know people like Georges Montadon and you know notorious anti semites in in Paris. Now, it's also true that he didn't ever join the Nazi Party or did not adhere. Um, to Nazi ideology, he did know some Nazis. Uh, I mean, he was particularly friendly with Karl Epting, who was not really. I mean, he was the the minister of of, of um, the culture in in Paris of the um, I can't remember what it's called, like the culture embassy in Paris. You know, for um, and, and he was a big admirer of French literature and Karl Epting. Even though clearly he was a member of the Nazi Party, he was, um, if we can put it that way, at the more acceptable end of the spectrum. But um, the this is in part the Nazis also didn't want anything to do with Sidney actually mm -hmm. because they saw him as too much of a maverick and a, you know, as you were saying earlier, unpredictable. Um, and he was not an ideologue; he was very much an individualist. So, mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, I I I do make the point in the book. Uh, none of this is mitigation for the anti-Semitism. I mean, I think one can be, as you as you yourself said, you know, one can be very anti-Semitic and not be a fully signed up member of the Nazi party. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was the case with Céline. Yes, he intersected with some Nazis, but then, you know, he was also critical of the Nazis as he was of Vichy, um, uh, and you know many other people um but it was very much um um but but yes he didn't show remorse that's absolutely un unquestionably true did did these pamphlets have a political plan was there any pragmatism or was it sort of just uh, almost like idealistic you know vitriol so i suppose one could say that they were pragmatic in the sense that he was advocating um uh an alliance between France and uh, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, Nazi Germany, and, and even though he was more more critical of fascist Italy, as a pragmatic move to avoid war, right? So he was sort of, you know, I don't remember the exact phrasing, but, it, you know, that Hitler, um, 
and he did say some positive things about Hitler, but also some some negative things. But he's saying, you know, we need to um, sign up with Hitler, and he was also very anti-communist. So I suppose he wove that into his pamphlets too. So I pragmatic, uh, yes, in the sense that um, it wasn't a purely ideological alliance he was advocating. It was more a case of let's prevent war. Let's just come to some kind of deal with Hitler and and, and Mussolini. Um, but of course, he does say, I, d- I don't think it can be denied, um, some shockingly anti-Semitic things about, you know, uh, uh, Jews not having the same sort of emotional qualities as, as Aryans. And he says, oh, la race Aryan, you know, the, the, the Aryan race is better than the Jewish race. And, but he does it in that very kind of Selenian, hyperbolic, extreme way. Um, so you can't really say that it's a, a coherent ideological agenda. It's just a bit of a scattergun, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which, it, but, but again, that doesn't justify it because it is anti-Semitic, unquestionably so. Um, but, you know, one can't really claim it's an ideological tract it's more of an anti-semitic rant Mm -hmm. in the midst of which there's a kind of um call or plea to come to some kind of um alliance with nazi germany and fascist italy yeah without with i mean i'm not always keen especially when there is you know this textual evidence of what the thing is but because of you know you mentioned that it's sort of the scattergun of very emotional sort of well, how do we place this politically pragmatically mm-hmm. in you know without perhaps getting too deep into like psychoanalyzing why he did these things yeah. it does seem like maybe the the writing of the pamphlets once again it's not ex- ex- excusing him but the writing of the pamphlets is almost like a projection of some hatred that was almost like left over from the the ex like what to do now well i need to exercise something somewhere and it's because it's because it's so that. emotional um, yes. Yeah. I, 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 I think I think that I think you're absolutely right. And you know, the, the, there have been, and you know, it's, it's one of those things of how do you rationalize the the irrational, right? I mean, how do you explain prejudice? It's it's, it's, it's not easy. And usually, yeah. I mean, you know, um, I mean, um, uh, I think um, one could look to social background to some degree that his father. Um, Ferdinand de Touche had been, you know, we're talking in the 1880s, 90, 1890s, was was um, anti Dreyfusard. So, you know, the, the Dreyfus affair, uh, where the Jewish lieutenant, French Jewish lieutenant, was made a scapegoat to accuse of spying for the Germans. And, you know, it, it brought the French government down. And um, you know, and then France was divided into the Dreyfusard, though, like Zola, people like Zola who defended Dreyfus, and then the anti Dreyfusard, those who tended to be right wing and anti Semitic anyway, and, and said, you know, Dreyfus is guilty. And of course, he was innocent. So, there, you know, you could argue, okay, insofar as values are often passed down from parents to children, uh, um, not always, but. Uh, maybe it was latent within him but then that's further um complicated by the fact that he satirizes his own father in death on credit his own father's anti-semitism in death on credit right uh in the in his you know portrayal of the, the august his the father really his his real father in death on credit and and you know it's, it's easy to fall into that kind of old cliche of you know the, the classic anti-semites defense of some of my best friends are, are jews but it is true that he also had before the pamphlets some really important uh mental figures who were jewish right like ludwig rachman who was his boss in the league of nations he was polish jewish um there was a guy called um uh, Edouard Benedictus in the uh, around 1918-20, who was a kind of mental figure to him. So there was no real evidence or clue that he would take this anti-Semitic turn. I mean, some critics say, oh no, but that's not true in one of his plays, um, 
there was wrote two plays, Paul, Paul Gay and Ligley's in the twenties that weren't particularly that never found a publisher until later. He does sort of satirize a little bit, you know, he creates a sort of stereotype of the of a power hungry uh, Jewish person in, in Le Progrès, but it's nowhere near as, uh, you know, and one might classify that as casual 1970s, but it's nowhere near as, no nothing like as bad as the pamphlet. So I think um, uh, the trigger seems to have been death on credit mm. and the perception of it. Uh, there's absolutely no concrete evidence to suggest that, you know, Jewish people were responsible for rejecting it en masse um, compared to others. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just another stereotype. But for whatever reason, that seems to have been the trigger. Um, there's another theory, perhaps more tenuous, that his partner, Elizabeth Craig, with whom he broke up in 32, 33, then went on to marry a, an American uh, a Jewish man by the name of Ben Tankle. But I, you know, that's probably speculative. So, again, I think the problem is that you're. How do you rationally explain a an irrational prejudice? Right. It's mm. it's not. Yeah. Mm. Well, I know. Um, I think. Yeah, we covered the pamphlets fairly well. We've covered the the writing and biography. But one thing I, you know, I wanted to get in here because uh, it was something we spoke about before we started recording. Is you know, really, we've had one of the biggest literary finds. Absolutely. Of, well. Recent, recent, I can't think of the last time there was been this 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 finding of what three so three manuscripts were found. Well, no, no, sorry, not found were revealed. Uh, yeah, twenty nineteen. Yes, uh, absolutely. So absolutely, and it's even more than three. Although three uh, have been um, published so far. So um, uh, three uh, unfinished novels, but finished enough to have been published or early drafts of novels. One is Guerre, War, the other is Londres, London, and the other is La Volonté du Roi Courgold, which was a more kind of medieval fantasy. And there's more to come. Uh, there's also a kind of um, an alternative draft of Death on Credit, which, you know, which which will be published by Gallimard as well. But to put it briefly, the, the story is that... Um, uh, Céline fled... Um, in June 44 from Montmartre. He was, you know, a marked man. Um, he fled France, clearly the war, you know, France, um, Germany was about to lose the war. He left behind him many manuscripts. He 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 wrote, uh, lamented their loss until the end of his life. Now, by various security, his apartment in Montmartre was subsequently occupied by a, resist, a member of the resistance called Yves Moranda. And years later in the early 80s, Yves Moranda's daughter, and son-in-law discovered by chance this cake box of manuscripts. Um, and they contacted, they were friends with or knew um, a journalist in Libération, you know, Lib uh, Lib um, which was a French-leaning newspaper uh, by the name of Thibauda. Um, and Thibauda, um, uh, they came to an agreement that um, uh, Thibauda would be entrusted with these manuscripts, but as long as Céline's widow, his third wife, Lucette de Touche, was alive, they would not be made public because they didn't want, um, you know, politically they were not aligned with Céline, but also that they didn't want um, Céline's widow and executors to uh, doctor or change the manuscripts or profit from them in any way. Mm -hmm. Now, Thibault Dad kept his word and nobody could have anticipated that Céline's widow, who said the Touche would die at the age of 107, you know, which is a good innings, as they say, uh, in November 2019. So at the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020, Thibaut contacted Céline's executors, mm -hmm. uh, François Gibault and uh, Véronique Chauvin, and said, I have, well, it was via a, a lawyer, actually, another, an intermediary, but, and said, Look, look what I've got. And everybody was just stunned. And it was quickly verified as genuine. Um, it led to a legal battle where the executive said, 
you should have not withheld this from us or from the you know um and and anyway Thibaudin lost they won and subsequently Gallimard um is publishing in sequence you know but allowing enough time for editors to edit the manuscripts um and three have come out so first it was Gare, then it was Long, and it was uh, what I call Gold, and then there's Cass People, and there are others on their on their way. Um, and in fact, they've already come out in um, the play ad. They've already been added to the uh, entirety, including Cass Peep, sorry, to the play ad edition, which I think came out in May this year, which I, I bought when I went to Paris. So um, it's a huge find. It's created a few moral it's had i would say it's had two of two um major consequences the first you might say is a is a a positive one in that it's rebalanced attention away from sitting the anti semite to sitting the great writer um by reminding us that he was a great literary writer it's not seeking to sweep the anti-semitism under the, under the carpet but previously the the critical landscape had reached an impasse where there was a, a big argument: should we republish his his anti-Semitic pamphlets or not? And this led to some fierce public debates. So now, get, now the focus once again is on selling the writer, the literary writer. Um, I think the second consequence, though, is to do with the, the ethics of 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 literature. In a way, you know, to to what extent can these unfinished novels be considered? Um, uh, on a par with his finished novels, right? Mm -hmm. So should they be published as novels that he would have intended to have been published? And the question is, well, we don't know. Probably probably they would have been further modified. Um, and, you know, I was I was asked, you know, and this has made it to the medium, and I was invited on to, to front row um, in August um, 21, you know, a very short notice to discuss this with... with and, Samira Ahmed and then you know it's it's sort of and, and the TLS commissioned a piece piece as well on 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 Long Gone and the manuscripts. So it's it's sort of entered the public forum and reignited debate on Celine, which um, you know, on the one hand was annoying for me because I didn't the discovery was made literally just as my book was coming out, so I didn't have a time a chance to talk about it in my book. But on the other hand, it's kind of um probably shone a spotlight on the ceiling in a way that I couldn't have anticipated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, without being sounding too coy, um, are the, uh, from what you've read of these new manuscripts of that, that are released, I mean, where do they, where do they stand for you? Are they masterpieces? Or... So, so, I mean, I think, um, Guerre, uh, which is much shorter than Londres, um, is, uh, so Guerre obviously means war is, it's a good companion piece to journey to voyage because it's 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 sort of continuous with that because it's the same character, the same semi autobiographical, you know, alter ego Ferdinand Baldami, literally as he's emerging injured from the battlefield. So you know, in journey, it's often been noted that you go from Ferdinand being injured from Baldami being injured to him more or less, you know, being demobilized, but there isn't much focus on the injury. So that, you know, one theory is that uh, Gare was removed from the original voyage, um, you know, it was cut, the original, that episode that discusses the injury in the aftermath, which is in a sense Gare in a way, um, was part of the original voyage. Others say, no, 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 it was always a standalone piece. And, and you know, the answer is we don't really know. Um, uh, but I, I think, um, okay, it's less insofar as one can say that Céline is polished because that's not his style of writing, but mm. there's a more unfinished quality. Um, there are gaps and the editors have done a very good job. Um, Londres, which which I focused on in my piece with the TLS, that's much longer. That's about five, over 500 pages. And it's sufficiently, um, the narrative is sufficiently coherent and strong and the um, the characters sufficiently fleshed out for it to read as a, uh, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a quality novel in its own right. 
The only thing I would say, however, is that it has um, some even more shocking <laughs> than normal depictions of sex and violence, which probably would not have made it past Celine's editor, Robert de Noël, at the time in, in, in 34. So, um, you know, it, it's highly likely that in the same way that Celine's editor excised, and it caused an argument, with Celine, you know, bits from Death on Credit, the more sexually explicit passages, um, it's likely he would have done the same for Lombard. So what we have is is a kind of um, you know the uncut version, if you will, of what would likely have been a, a more developed version of that novel. But um, I haven't yet finished reading um, the Wild Call Gold or, or the the um, the the more the other episodes of Caspi. But there's more to come, I think, from um, uh, Gallimard of, of the alternative version of Death on Credit, but. You know, to answer your question, there's enough there to um, to be enjoyed on its own merits, with the caveat that it's not quite the finished product that Celine would have intended, or indeed that his editor would have, his publisher would have authorized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, where would you advise people to begin with Celine? So, I mean, you know, it's at the risk of sounding predictable. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that Journey to the End of the Night would, you know, his, his best known work is probably the best starting point. However, I think um, I would also say, yes, Death on Credit, because that's um, regarded by many as his, uh, some would even say it's, it's better than, you know, uh, Journey. But in, of the, I, I would also recommend two others. I mean, the of the later novels, um, the so-called German trilogy, which is um, uh, from Castle to Castle, um, North and Rigaudan. Um, I think North is the best of those three. I mm -hmm. mean, I mean, I'm not the only person to say that. I think it's a tight novel. It's um, it shows his stylistic development. Um, it's got quite a strong plot as well. I mean, you know, some of the kind of early 50s novels like uh, Fairy Point Autrefois are, are brilliant stylistically, but are arguably more difficult to read because there's not much narrative there. Um, and I think for the reasons I just mentioned, I think Guerre, uh, War, but also because it's short, is a good companion piece. If we're talking about the recently discovered manuscript novels, um, I would say, yeah, um, but, you know, it's it's clearly, I mean, for those who develop a taste for Céline's uh, fiction, then, you know, really any anything, uh, you know, I would I would say all all of his uh, all of his novels, but those those uh, four, I would say, yeah, uh, Journey, Death on Credit, North and Guerre. And that's about to come out in English translation, um, well, quite soon. I've, um, but you know, for those who read the original French, it's it's there, and I think it's already been translated into German and Italian, actually. Okay, okay, it's a good selection. Well, I think we've um, we've covered a lot. We've covered your book. We've covered a lot of Celine. So, what are you um, what are you working on now? Um, well, <laughs> good question. Uh, the last year I've been more in a kind of uh, a managerial type role because I was, you know, head of the department, but I haven't really had as much chance to work on any research as I would have liked. But I think um, I want to perhaps do an another article on the manuscripts beyond the, the TLS. You know, I think there's more that can be said about the, the manuscript works. But I think um, probably for my... You know, I, I probably need to give Celine a break for a little bit after that, <laughs> maybe for my own mental health as much as for anything else. Um, I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of doing something on Malraux, André Malraux, um, possibly a biography, but also, you know, I've got one of the two other um, sort of smaller projects in the, in the pi pipeline um, to do with the role of the intellectual in France, you know. Um, so... It's it's um, but yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to do as far as Celine is concerned. I'd like to maybe do something else on the on the manuscripts because this is obviously fresh terrain, and 
you know, ripe for discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll be sure to put uh, links in the description below for Louis Ferdinand Celine, Journeys to the Extreme. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Which can be found in online and in all good bookstores. Um, but Damien Gatani, I think that's a good place to finish up. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me um, and I've enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.